John chapter 20. You heard a little bit about it earlier when Blakely read a smaller portion. I want to expand, read a little bit before and a little bit after, because this is one of my favorite passages about how people interact with Jesus after he's out of the tomb. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we wonder, did he really get out? We ask ourselves this question a couple thousand years later, like, we know we heard about this, but do I really believe this moment? All right, let's read together, starting in verse 1 of John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, Now, the other disciple is this guy named John who's writing this book. He's being a little bashful, talking about himself in the third person. The other disciple, the one Jesus loved. I mean, you just got to, like, lay it on thick. Like, not only is the other disciple, but he's the one Jesus loved, you know, the most. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple, you know, the one Jesus loved, outran Peter. Like, again, like, you, you're just bragging now. It just sounds weird. And he reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Simon Peter came along, finally, John is saying, a little slow on the uptake for the run, but he finally got there, came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, again, bragging, also went inside, and he saw and he believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. Now hold that phrase. I think that's fascinating. Thinking he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. You can imagine she's a little indignant at this point. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. And Jesus said this, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. And that is where our reading ends today. I'm fascinated by these moments where people encounter Jesus after the grave. Because... You can imagine we are still, like I said earlier, still talking about it. I was hanging out with some pastors recently. You can imagine this is something that I do. Maybe not all the time, but occasionally I hang out with some pastors. I was at a nerd conference. It's called a Bible conference just a few weeks ago. There's a bunch of smart people that bring papers and they read and they dive into things about Scripture I have not even thought about yet. And I'm so excited to be hanging in this crew and I don't feel like I measure up all the time. But then there's like real talk. If you're going to like smart people time and then you go to lunch and then at lunch, everybody is just hungry. And then you get the real people. You hang out with them. And one pastor, we were talking about this and she was telling the story about encountering a family member of hers who really is struggling with the concept that Jesus is real. And so this, this pastor that I know wanted to like dive deeper, but this pastor, because we go to pastor school and they tell you things, don't laugh at people in their face when they say crazy things. Like that's what we're told. Like, so she, she did the smart thing. She didn't laugh in, in that family member's face, but she said inquisitively, why does Jesus give you so much struggle? And she goes, I just don't know if I can take Jesus seriously because you know, 
There's a story in the Old Testament about a talking donkey. And you're like, that is true. And we got to deal with that. But I love how like, the, the, the pastor that I knew in, encountering this family member said, so Jesus coming out of the grave is totally fine with you, right? But it's the donkey that gets... Like, so you're just, like, just having some fun with that one. And you're like, yeah. So what is the hang-up? Because people have had hang-ups for years. And we lack empirical evidence. Right? If we were going to do our hard, hard work of going back in time, the thing we lack is there is no videotape about Jesus coming out of the grave. And many of us would be like, if I could just see that, that would be really, really helpful. But there is one piece of empirical evidence that we do have and we can rest assuredly on. It is the witness of people who were there that day and the witness of people who were there after and who felt the effect of this Jesus who not only went to death on a cross and was buried in a grave, but eventually came out. And it's that empirical evidence that we either have to trust the word of the people who were there or we don't. And people have had that question for a long time. We are not the first ones. This generation is not the first ones like, I don't know what to do with Jesus. Should I just shelve him? Should I just pull him out at Easter time? What do I do? I really love Christmas. The cool thing about the baby in a manger in Bethlehem. I like that. But I don't know what to do with Jesus when Christians go around saying he's your savior. He's the one who paid the price, even these words that showed up in the songs that we sang today. If I could back the train up a little bit, we're in John 20 right now, but if we were to go back to John 11, nine chapters previous, there's a story about another guy who was raised from the grave, a guy named Lazarus, and even we sang about it this morning, and the song goes this morning, just like Lazarus, you've brought me back to life. And if you go to that storyline, if you remember how the setting is, Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they have sent word to Jesus. They know this guy. They have sent word to Jesus who's in another town and say, hey, if you could come early, if you could come quickly, if you will, you can heal our brother who's very sick. And Jesus doesn't move according to their plans. And when Jesus finally shows up in town, Lazarus is dead and he's buried. And Martha comes to him. Again, indignant, not unlike the person we have in this story. And she says to him, I can imagine her pointing her finger at him and saying, if you would have been here, Lazarus would not have died. You know, when someone comes at you really hard with something, you're like, what am I going to say in this moment? And Jesus says something that sometimes we come across Jesus' phrases and you're like, I, okay. And Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And Martha says this, and it's in scripture, you can look it up. She goes, oh, I know he'll rise with the resurrection in the end. So for Jewish people of that day, there were still those who believed in a resurrection, but for them it was the end of the story. So when Martha encounters, or Mary encounters this empty tomb, and then Peter runs, not as fast as the other disciple, by the way, but when they both get there and they notice that the tomb is empty, they have to make a decision. Is this the end? Is this the end of time, or have they just stolen the body? What do we say? If they were just lying about it, there would have been enough people out there to call their bluff. But that's not what we have. We actually have really good evidence, and actually extra biblical evidence that supports the case that there was a man named Jesus who went to death on a cross, who was buried in a grave, and he was alive. There was enough people that encountered the risen Lord. But what is it about you and me? How do we take this storyline today? What are we supposed to do with it? And again, I love this passage because I love the fact that Mary says, or thought to herself, he looked like the gardener. I am captivated by this concept that sometimes Jesus acts in a way that I was not expecting him to act. And he shows up looking like someone I wasn't expecting him to look like. Have you ever done that? Have you ever drawn a box around how God is supposed to act and say, if you do this, then I'll believe you? As if God is supposed to just do what we say. What are we supposed to do with a God who acts differently than that? And that is exactly how Mary encounters him this day. He is not looking like what she wanted him to look like, but he looks like the gardener. And enough about that. We might come back to that one. But the other part of the story that I'm captivated by is Jesus. 
And you're like, you're supposed to say that. It's Easter Sunday. Not like this. I'm captivated because Jesus seems like a jerk. Here's why. The moment that she is crying, it's as if Jesus lacks empathy. Do you have a carrying bone in your body, Jesus? Like, are you, do you have a heart of stone? Like, could you at least put your hand around, like an arm around her and like say, hey, Mary, it's going to be okay. That's not what he does. And you get it in verse 17. Do not hold on to me. Seems a little harsh, Jesus. Like, what are you doing? For I have not yet ascended to the Father. Do not hold on to me. I love this angle that Jesus takes with Mary, one of his most devoted followers and disciples. She was there when all the guys left. She was there. And Jesus says, do not hold on to me. Have you ever thought about holding on to something? Holding on to something is always about control. Think about it. We have... um, We have a new driver in our family. She's learning the ways to get her license. But let's not even put her in the front seat driving. I'll be in the front seat driving. And my wife, who is next to me, does not trust me. I don't know if you have a spouse like this, but literally, I'm driving, and I'm not even looking at my phone. I promise you. And she thinks we're going to die. She grabs that handle. Do you know what that handle is? Like Some of you have a phrase for that handle. And like, she grabs it like we're about to go over the edge of the cliff. And we haven't. Like, we are in the lane, but she thinks it's going to... So she's grabbing on for dear life because she wants to control the situation. Some of you have been on a plane. You know the moment when you get turbulence? Like, a little bit of turbulence, like, you know, three seconds. We can deal with that. What about turbulence that lasts? Like, if you're a kid, you're like, whoa, it's now an... It's like a roller coaster. This is so cool, right? And then all the adults on the plane are freaking out. Some people are freaking out. Have you ever grabbed, like, the edge of the seat, and you're like... Or perhaps the, the hand next to you, even if it's not someone you know. I got it, like, and dug into it. it. Just not me? Okay, not you. That's cool. Uh, but, you know, we try to control by the ways that we hold on to things. And some of you who are parents, you know this well. You try to hold on to things and the ways that your kids have grown up, or you're like, if I could just hold on to a way that they were back then, I want to control. I want to control. I want to control the story. I want to be able to control everything. And this idea that Jesus says to her that day, do not hold on to me, because he is flipping upside down the understanding of control. We cannot control Jesus the way that we think we can. He is up to something that we often do not know because there are days that he might look like the gardener. There are days that he is in places that we weren't expecting him to be. And he is doing things that we don't always get. And I cannot control him. Oh man, I wish I could. I wish I could pray and he would do exactly what I say. And like, like I hang out with him a lot. Like I, I, mean, I hope I do. Like, I mean, I'm reading his word a lot. I'm studying things. And even he doesn't always do what I want him to. Because he is always in places that surprise me. And when Mary encounters him that day, he looks like the gardener, what she wasn't expecting. You can play that one out for a while. And then he's doing things that she doesn't always get. Because God is always up to a new start. And go with me on this. Do you remember the last time you heard about a garden in the Bible? We have to go all the way back to the beginning. It's this thing called the Garden of Eden. That's where new life began. I wonder if it was the reason he looks like the gardener in that day when Mary found him is because I wonder if God's doing something new again. And if you were to reach into the future and even take the imagery that we get from the last book of the Bible, Revelation, there's imagery of a garden that eventually becomes a city of restoration on how God is going to fix it all. And I know you're like, well, what do I do with that on this day? Because it still is not all hunky-dory for me. Because God is doing things differently. Because Jesus is always up to things that we don't fully understand. Like, take the story in Mark. Now, there's another story I love to read because it's confounded me. The moment that, that Jesus goes across the Jordan River and he goes into a land filled with pig farmers. Do you remember this story? 
This one I love because I know his Jewish mother was like, don't go to where the pig farmers are. Like, that's the bad side of town. Like, don't go over there. And then he has the nerve to go over there. And when he gets there, he encounters a man who is demon-possessed. I love this story because it sounds so crazy. When he encounters a demon-possessed guy, Jesus knows what he's going to do, but it confounds the people watching him. Do you remember how he says to them, what is your name? And like the demons from within the guy speak and they say, uh, my name is Legion. And if you look that up, you're like, well, Legion means many. There were probably many demons inside this guy. However, have you thought about this? Legion is actually the name of the army that was occupying Rome at the time. That's how Rome operated. When they wanted to get things done, they would send a legion of troops to an area, and it was a legion of troops around Jerusalem that were trying to keep peace at the same time of that story. But get this, because I looked it up, and some of you do what I do. When you find out a fact, you're like, is that really true? Let's Google that. You do that at church even when I'm speaking. You don't trust me. I get it. We can be on this relationship, and I will trust you all the same, okay? But you look things up. You're like, really, what's happening? Is that really true? Was there a legion? Yes, there was. Get this, and I love it, because the moment Jesus heals that guy who's demon-possessed, the demons come out of him and then go to the pigs, right? What else are you going to put them in? The pigs. And the pigs go over the edge of the cliff, and they go into the river, and they drown. You're like, why does God hate pigs? That's not the point of the story, by the way, but you've got to be wondering, is that really it? But the image on the flag of the legion army that surrounded Jerusalem at the time. You can look this up. The the image on the flag is of a wild boar. What is God up to when Jesus comes into a place, sets a demon-possessed man free, sends the image or the, the, uh, the demon into the pigs, they go over the cliff and they die in the sea? When's the last time you remember God doing something where an army chasing his people went over the cliff and into the sea And they died. It's exactly what he's been doing all along. Because when we encounter God, when we encounter Jesus, he is up to things that we don't understand. God is in the business of freeing his people. He has always done that. That is the one thing I can stand on. If I know anything about God, it's that he frees his people. He frees the people from the past in the the book of Exodus. He does the same that day when the demon-possessed man is on the other side of the Jordan River. And when Mary encounters him at the grave and it's empty and she is surprised and he looks like the gardener and he says to her, do not hold on to me. He is freeing her from the expectations we have of how we put them on God and say, do not try to box me in. That's what Jesus is up to. Because when it comes to Easter Sunday, and we don our best, like even Yuli mentioned earlier, and we come and we want the picture, and and like even it looks beautiful in here. You do really look like beautiful people. You should come back next week. It's going to be a great Sunday. But sometimes we think I can just check this off my box and get God off my back today. But I guarantee you, God is moving and working and having his being all around us, and we don't even know it. So my prayer and my hope on this Easter Sunday is that when you leave this place and you walk around other places, is that you encounter God in such a profound way that he he surprises you again. When's the last time you've been surprised? When's the last time you're like, yeah, That is totally how God works. God is not in the nitty-gritty stuff that we get really upset about. He's not in the weeds. He is in the business of freeing his people. And I don't know what that means for you right now. What do you need freedom from? What are you walking into right now that is just so plagued with pain and fear and anxiety that God wants to free you from? And I know we're here, we're doing the church thing, but I am also keenly aware, we have family friends that are just, they're in the hospital today because their daughter is plagued with mental health issues that she had to be admitted yesterday. So for me, like, I know that story, and I'm like, I can be here before you, and I can read this, 
And I believe this, but I know for a fact that Jesus is in that hospital room with that family. He is exactly where he needs to be to proclaim peace and love and justice and righteousness and hope. Where do you need to have hope again? What's been happening in your life that you need to be surprised at how God works? Because he is a God that gives life. He is the God that gets out of the grave. He is a God that is up to something new in the ways that he is creating the future. And I know there are days that look shady and it looks weird and it doesn't look like God's actually doing anything. But I promise you, much like Mary that day when she thought he was the gardener, may we have eyes to see and to be surprised on what God's doing. Would you pray with me? Lord, on this Easter Sunday, we want to share the good news of hope that we have because you defeated death. But it's more than just a history lesson that we go back to and be like, we're so glad that you did it then. Lord, we need you to continue to do it. And may we have eyes to see that. Wherever we go today and tomorrow and the rest of this week, we don't want to even look beyond that. We just want to see you this week. May the veil come off of our eyes. May we be knocked on our butts because you have surprised us on how you work. Would you even tap us on the shoulder and whisper into our souls the moments when we come across people that might look like the gardener and be surprised that it's you? May we have eyes to see and to trust yet again. For those in the room that it's been a while since they have considered you, I pray that they can sense your presence this morning. You are a good God, always in the business of bringing life to each one of us. May we sense that well today. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.